All right, so let me get my notes here. All right, um, so welcome everybody to the Canadian Society for Organic Urban Land Care, SOULS, National Weekly Zoom Series, 2022 Year of the Ecological Garden. My name's Sandora Alfred Purvis, and I'm hosting today from Ottawa, Ontario, on the unceded lands of the Algonquin Anishinaabek people. We meet every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, for 45 minutes with anyone interested in learning or sharing more about working holistically with the land. We can't do our work without the support, and we gratefully acknowledge support from Gaia College, the leading school for organic land care professional development and diploma courses. If you are interested in learning about land care, their fall semester starts next week. Um, SOUL's membership includes accredited professionals, and SOUL also welcomes public memberships who wish to support ecological and holistic land care. If you're not a member, do please consider joining. You can find the information at organiclandcare.org. Um, so every month we feature a theme that impacts our work, and this month's theme is urban biodiversity. Melanie, Ull see, I tracked before and now I'm coming. <laughs> Melanie Ouellette is our guest today, and she will be talking with us about how to start a local native plant seed library. After her presentation, we'll open it up to, audi to the audience to take questions. Um, you can add them to the chat while Melanie's presenting and I can read them out after uh, after her presentation or after the presentation you are welcome to unmute and ask questions directly. Um, so please take it away. Melanie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, on behalf of the Ottawa Wild Flower Seed Library, I want to thank you for um, joining us and listening to this presentation. As Sandra said, my name is Melanie Willett, and I founded the Ottawa Wildflower Seed Library in 2020. And today I'm going to talk to you um, about how you can do the same in your community. And so the agenda of our presentation today is to touch upon what is the Ottawa Wildflower Seed Library, why we need local seed libraries, and how you can do it too in your community. So just to make sure that we are all on the same page, I thought it would be good to start with the definition of native plants. Um, so by native plants, we mean terrestrial and aquatic plants that were here before European settlement. And they include trees, shrubs, grass, grasses, and flowers. And the reason why we care about native plants is because they've been co-evolving with our, with our wildlife for thousands of years. And some species, species are even dependent on specific plants to be able to live. A classic example is the monarch butterfly that is dependent on milkweed uh, to lay its eggs on and you know, for, to feed its caterpillars. And so sometimes what happens is when native plants die, the species that are dependent on them also die with them. And so native plants are a really important part of our ecosystem. And it's not because it's in the wild that it's native. So we encourage people, you know, when they start being interested in native plant gardening, to start by IDing the plants that they have in their gardens. And so then they kind of familiarize themselves with what is native and what is what is what is not native. So about the Ottawa Wildflower Seed Library. And so we are brand new organization. We started in 2020 in the middle of COVID. <laughs> and what we do is we provide free seeds uh, to any individuals and to any amount that the individuals want. And the idea is we give you seeds and once they bloomed, we ask you to return the seeds to the library so we can pass them on to others. And so that's the concept between, behind the library. And in 2021, because of COVID, uh, we had to mail out our seeds. And so we mailed seeds to 150 individuals, some school projects, and we estimate that it resulted in a minimum of 4,000 new native plants. And then in 2021 and 2022, which was our second year, uh, we were able to hold seven cross city events. And then all the seeds that were leftovers after these events, what we did is we mailed them 
to an additional 200 household cottages. You know, and we also support like community projects. And we estimate that it resulted in a minimum of 22,500 new native plants. And another fact that's really interesting is that our work resulted in 150 different species being offered across our city. So we have the volume, but we also have the diversity. So why do we need more seed libraries? Why is this work important? Um, we need us to, you know, lower barriers to native plant gardening. Uh, as we know, like uh, lower economic uh, society, like uh, communities don't have access as much to greener spaces. So that's a way to uh, provide nature to anybody, regardless of their socioeconomic status. Also, uh, gardening can feel overwhelming at times, especially if you've never gardened before. And so by providing a community that surrounds these new gardeners, it can help people feel more empowered to be able to be agents of change. There's also eco-anxiety. You know, people feel anxious about climate change and so forth, and they don't know what to do. And so seed libraries uh, provide a way also for people to be able to contribute and you know like as soon as you start planting those native plants nature will come back into your space and so it's very rewarding and it rewards people quickly and so it helps also manage the overwhelming feeling that you might get uh, when you start a project uh, seed libraries are also important because they protect the genetic diversity and integrity of species um, the seed library does not accept cultivars cultivars are um, human modified plants that result from you know taking two species together and to create plants that have enhanced characteristics such as longer bloom periods or uh, nice colors you know less foliage and so the impact the ecological impact of cultivars hasn't been a subject of many research right now um, but, you know, like our seed library makes sure that we have what we call straight species, which is the same um, as you would find typically in the wild. We also, you know, offer a, a broadened level of species. As I've mentioned last year, we have offered 115 different species. And so that's something that, you know, companies don't typically do because they will focus on trying to make money and uh, sell plants that they know are going to be bought by a larger number of people, which you know makes sense. And so, whereas you know, for us, we have the flexibility of offering plants that might not result in you know making money, but they're still very important for our you know, environment. And so, that's also something that we can bring forward a higher diversity that we might not find otherwise. And also, like we support various habitats. Um, you know, plant that we see that are typically offered for uh, sale, uh, often really focused on like gardeners, but we do have people that contact us because they want to do, for example, like prevent soil erosion or, uh, you know, like uh, manage like invasive species. And so it's not just about the aesthetics of the garden, but it's also supporting various habitats. Another thing that we can do as seed libraries is teach people responsibilities. When we learn to drive, we have to demonstrate that we understand those responsibilities. And then we are offered a license that enables us to drive. Unfortunately, um, you know, for gardening, we don't have to have a license to be able to garden. And that can have like negative uh, impact on our environment. And so when we offer science-based information, we can help people make informed choices. Uh, we also make sure that, you know, whereas we encourage people to use native plants, uh, we foster ethical harvesting. So then collectively, we don't deplete our natural environment. And also by asking people to check back their seeds in after we've donated seeds to them, we also encourage people to give back to the community and foster reciprocity across the board. So, you can do it too. <laughs> and here's how. So, you know, before I lost the seed library, I, you know, like I did a little bit of research 
And then I found that there's two main barriers preventing people from gardening with native plants. You know, the first one is the lack of seed availability. And you know, in our world, we do have uh, some native uh, plant sellers, but you know, there's no native seed sellers to my knowledge. And we know that it's best to have locally available seeds because they're the ones that are most uh, adapted to our local ecosystem. And the intent of a seed library is just to leverage each other's surpluses, put it in a community pool, and then so that they don't go to waste. And so that's like, it's like creating like a seed bank. And so that helps with that. And then the other barrier uh, that I identified was a lack of knowledge. So people don't necessarily know what a native plant is. And you know, like native plants are not like vegetable gardening, for example, where you have your schedule and you know, like it's like tomatoes, it's February, and you know, by October you're done. And so like it's a little bit different. And you know, depending on the weather, depending on the like, species, you know, like it's it's not a one size fits all. And so the learning curve to be able to garden with native plant is a little higher than you would in you know using traditional gardening. And so the intent is also like trying to address that with information to support people. And so the solutions that we came up with was, you know, make sure that your operations are simple and then have consistent social media content that includes like easy instructions. So make it simple, you know, follow Mother Nature's rhythm. Uh, I remember when I was trying to figure out, okay, when are we going to give seeds and so forth? It was very confusing because it's a different schedule. And so here's what I came up with, um, you know, like follow Mother Nature's rhythm. You know, the plants bloom in spring, summer, and fall. And once that's done, collect the seeds and offer the seeds November, December-ish, maybe January-ish, so that people have a chance to winter sow them which is the easiest way to do it. And, you know, like, and then organize events to share extra seasons and plants in the spring and summer. And then this is kind of the annual calendar we follow. Um, I make sure also that we never have an inventory so that we don't need a space to keep an inventory. Uh, once the events and the mailing is done, like in January, February, then we don't have anything in, in store until we start exchanging seasons and plants. And so I think that's like, because, uh, you know, success is this seedlings and the seeds find homes. It's not for us to hoard the seeds. And so when people contact us, like outside of these kinds of years, we tell them to come back in the fall. And so just follow Mother Nature's rhythm. I think that's the easiest way to do it. Don't keep an inventory if you can and then the other one is provide clear instructions you know like people need help selecting plants you know designing tips uh so many instructions and also what we've done on the website and i'm happy to share if anybody wants to use, reuse them is we have like printable labels and so people just go on our website and hit print and then we, you know just use scissors cut them put them on our um the different seed envelopes and you know it makes like a common like standard look and feel and it's easier for people to grow their plants at home also don't reinvent the wheel uh what i do uh when i started what i did when i started was to like start by following like-minded organizations and share information with your members you know there's a lot of other organizations that are trying to do the same thing as we are. And so we don't need to reinvent the wheel, like let experts like guide us and let us just reshare their content. Be science-based. I think that's also another piece of advice I would give um, because people right now are really turned off by, you know, being told what to do, being told, you know, talked down to. Uh, people are, have had enough of controversial statements. People want to be treated like intelligent beings, you know, and I think like science is science. And we need to trust that when people have good information, they're going to make better decisions. And I think that's a better way to approach it, to make sure that everybody feels included and we move away from decisiveness on social media. Also, like one of the concerns is often cost. 
So what we've done to keep environmental impact and financial costs low is encourage people to make their own envelopes. So we have instructions on our website. We uh, we have also like teenagers in Ontario, they have to provide a certain number of hours of volunteering. So, you know, we also use them. Uh, and we tell people to reuse like scraps of paper, like plastic pots, containers, window screens. So then it doesn't cost anything. And we are good for the environment by giving a life to things that would normally go into the recycling bin. Um, convince early adopters, I think. You know, sometimes like people are trying to include everybody, you know, and I think like good communications and having a target audience in mind, don't try to be everything to everyone. What you need, you know, when you lead change is get a, a you know, core work of early adopters that are convinced about your work and they're that are going to do the convincing for you moving forward. And, you know, while it might feel like a big undertaking, you don't need that many donors. Um, like I think last year you saw all the metrics that we have and probably received like donations from maybe like a dozen big donors. Because if you think about it, like, you know, when you have like, I don't know, Black Eyed Susans, like, you know, you got 20 of them, you probably have enough, you know, if you put 30 to 50 seeds per seed envelope, uh, like we ask people to do, like you have, you will have seeds for like dozens of people. And so you don't need that many people when you're getting started. Uh, but the important thing is to take the next step and then, you know, as people receive the seeds, they're going to pass them on. And then you're going to create that chain of uh, reciprocity. And also finally, like ask for help. Like a lot of people are looking for causes and ways to make an Im impact in this world and they want to leave a better world for their kids. And I think like, uh, whereas sometimes you feel like you're alone, like in your house, like trying to start a seed library, like there's a lot of people that are responding to the message and you will talk to them. And you know, like, uh, like what I've learned also, like the seeds will do the work for you. Like, you know, once people grow native plants, they will feel the impact of native plants they will feel more connected to the nature and it's in our nature as humans to respond to nature and want and want to do more and so i think you have to trust that the seeds will do their work and also that people are going to respond to that and help you also so don't be afraid to ask for help and um, every time i've needed help i've always gone like on our facebook group and say i need help and I always exactly need what I need. So I encourage you to trust that process and the reciprocity that comes with setting up a seed library. And so I wanna thank you for your time. And so um, I know it's a bit challenging uh, to understand how to set up a seed library in a 15, 20 minute presentation. And so, and it needs like more conversation probably. So, you know, I encourage you to contact me like either through like a, email we also have a website where you can copy some of the resources that we have uh, that we can share in your community and you can also see like what we've been doing on social media by following us on uh, twitter instagram and facebook all right thank you very much uh it's really a good uh, overview of uh, sort of the things to keep in mind and yeah some really good advice there on spread the work out. I always uh, end up having to remind myself on various things that so sometimes trying to take everything up uh, on, on yourself not only mm. burns you out, but it actually takes away the opportunity for other people yes. who want to be mm. doing something yeah. helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's an opportunity that mm. uh, it not, yes. not a matter of sparing people work. It's, it's actually can be sometimes reducing their opportunities. Yes, um, I agree because like, um, especially, uh, you know, since the pandemic, like people feel really isolated at home mm -hmm. and they can feel the world is on fire and it feels empowering to them to be able to contribute to something and feel like they're doing something and connected with like-minded people. And so I think this project has a lot of value in and asking for help and making sure we make those connections. Well, I always like to say it's it's one of those things that can help save the world and you get flowers. Cute. Like, <laughs> it's not the love. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, so I know the two of us can kind of just keep chatting, but I'm going to invite everyone uh, who's who's watching today. If if you have questions, um, please go ahead and like, you can raise your hand under the reaction thing. You can unmute um, so that you pop up in the screen. Um, and uh, yeah, ask questions, or if you prefer not to be on screen, if you type them into the chat, I can read them out. So um, please go ahead, ask your questions. Um, if you're thinking about starting a project like this, if there's things you've started and you're like, I'm stuck, how do I move ahead? Uh, I, I've uh, sort of I've been a, a bystander and a seed contributor um, yes, sure, to yeah. the, the Wildflower <laughs> Seed Library. But um, I've sort of stood back quietly in awe with how quickly <laughs> and how effectively um, you, you've grown this. This uh, so. Um, okay, good. We're starting to get some questions. Um, let me just pull the chat over here, and I'm actually going to. I'm going to. Um, Ask you to share. end the screen sharing yeah. so that we'll just have uh, us up here. Perfect. And let me just put the chat back. Come on. Where is my chat? My chat disappeared when the screen changed. There it goes. So um, what were your requirements for geographical range? I mean, did you focus mm -hmm. on Southern Ontario or Canada in general? Um, how big of a range were you looking at? Thanks. That's oh, yeah, guess. that's an excellent question. So the first year, like I am. Um, like I didn't specify the range and we even had like uh, like people contacting me from BC to get some seeds, but then the native, like you have to follow what's native in your region. And so like plants are part of an eco region. And so if you go outside of that, then they're not native anymore. And so, um, so, you know, for the in-person events, obviously you have to travel. But then when it comes to mailing, uh, what I've said is I've prioritized requests first that are part of the Ottawa Valley. So that includes the Quebec side all the way to upper Desno Valley. And then also like uh, here, like, you know, from the Quebec border on the Ontario side to Kempville and Canada already. So, and Lanark County. So, you know, prioritizing your eco region first and foremost, because that's, kind of what the seeds, you know, the seeds are locally adapted. And so, um, and so I think that makes the most sense, but you know, like I've mailed seeds to like, uh, like when I have leftovers to, you know, Toronto, Brampton and so forth, but you know, they, they mostly have to be like um, for community projects or, you know, they still have to have some form of native, uh, the, the seeds need to be native to that region as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, I just tossed in the chat the link for Vascan, uh, the Vascular Plants of Canada yes. database, where you can look up. It doesn't do the eco regions, unfortunately, but it does at least tell you um, the status of a plant by the province. So whether yeah. they are native or are introduced species to that province, and they cover all kinds of species that are growing outside of cultivation. So whether they're introduced or not, if they're growing in the wild, then um, they'll be included in there. And it's it's a really, it's a help, it's a website I only uh, came across a couple of years ago and it's been incredibly helpful. Yes, in my, and it's uh, peer reviewed too, because there are some other sites out there that are not peer, re peer reviewed. And so I think it's really important to use something that scientists recognize as being the database rather than some list that somebody has that we can't validate. So. And there are some plants I have in my uh, in, in various places I tend that I have introduced because they got them from native seed suppliers and mm -hmm. they are native to this continent, but some of them aren't even native to this country. Yeah. Um, and the things that I found out after the fact. Yeah, All right. Um, so some said, this is a great idea. I can contribute and will request some as I'm in the process of planting more native plants. See, this yeah. is what happens. <laughs> we get them and then we cycle yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> uh, somebody put in are there instructions on when and how to collect seeds yeah so that's a bit challenging and so Dora can speak to it a lot more than me because you're the one that collects the most seeds that I know of so do you want to speak to that Sandora maybe um so this is one of the things around growing native plants that going from sort of a lifetime of conventional gardening to really yeah. over the last few years becoming more and more engaged in growing uh, and nurturing native plants and now growing a lot for seed and then that is um, 
pay attention to your plants because there's a whole bunch of things you can learn, not just when the seeds are right, but when, uh, you know, which species interact with them, where they thrive, what species they thrive alongside, like which other plant species. Um, and what I've mostly observed with, with seed gathering is you do want to watch for the start of drying down. So a lot of seeds that are ones that will have uh, species that will have floating seeds, you've got to wait till that puff starts to develop. And, you need, and if you can't sort of pinch the top of the fluff and have it pull easily uh -huh. out, the seeds aren't right. If they're in pods, wait for the pods to brown. But the other thing I've started to really watch for is the stem directly below. And it can be like right below because they dry down slowly. Uh -huh. For a lot of species, I look for from having learned the hard way sometimes of a pod that looked brown or, or even black, but then open it up and there was still still green on the inside. Mm. As soon as the stem just below the seed head starts to dry, then you're, you're safe to go and clip them. And then I usually bring in, with most species, I do bring in sort of whole seed heads, allow them to dry and then and then oh. uh, then there's on to the whole seed cleaning thing. Um, so watch for them to start to dry. There will be, there are some species out there that do an impressive job of flinging their seeds. Yes. So as soon as they open, they're gone. Yes, like <laughs> uh, well, milkweed, they float away. I find as long, if you squeeze the pod on milkweed yeah. and it splits, you're good to go. You can harvest the pod. If, yeah, but still, you have, I watch them like a few times a day. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, but yeah, <laughs> it's a day to day thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, flea banes, like they go straight from the blooming stage to floof without drying down in between. So there, there's ones you just have to, you, you'll learn from watching. Um, and yeah, some of the ones with exploding seed heads, much to my surprise. Um, even the native wild geranium, the Ontario one, they're spring loaded. They actually go sprawling. Yes. They're hilarious. The um, uh, yeah, so the some zipper. seeds, yeah, that I, I, and even seed heads that I've, I've um, violets, blue violets, they're the same ones. You can mm. harvest the pods just before they mature. And I had some sitting in my uh, dining room drying and I kept hearing this little tiny, tiny quiet mm. tick sounds. And I was like, what the heck? <laughs> so it took, took me a day or two to figure out it was the pods as they were drying they were literally squeezing the seeds out so wow. so, so there always will be mm. will be some learning curves but a lot mm. of them if they have a fluffy seed head just wait until it starts to go fluffy if they have a pod or they hold their seeds somehow mm. wait till it starts to turn brown and some of them you might miss that first year because <laughs> you're like wait a second they exploded um the other thing i've learned to watch for is any any of the grasses often the tops they release the seeds while they're still drying. So if you actually sort of pinch the tops mm. and gently sort of slide your hand along them, if seeds come loose, that's when to start gathering them. Mm. But it there will always be a learning curve. Um, oh, can I just add something before we move on? Yeah. Like just another question. I think also like uh, one of the paradigm shift that we have to do with native plant gardening is traditionally, like um, we were told that we are removed from nature. Like, you know, there's, nature and there's humans and then we don't have an, a, a role to play in nature like we are meant to just be separate and when you start gardening with native plants you have to like you will come to realize that you have to have a relationship with every species that you plant to be able to monitor you know when the seeds are gonna be ready to harvest and what kind of insects are eating off them and and so there's no standardized approach, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. And that's kind of how you develop that relationship that is so fulfilling. And so you just have to be patient and give yourself time to learn more about your plan. Like if you were starting to date somebody, you wouldn't expect to know everything from the beginning. So give, your <laughs> give yourself some time to get to know your plants. You know? <laughs> yes, these are complex beings. They're, yeah, they're exactly. worth getting to know. <laughs> Um, oh, this is one, and you, you've heard me go on about some of the, are, are there native plants that you desire, and are there plants that are not desired in terms of being too aggressive? Oh, go ahead, Sandra. I want to oh, know okay. you okay. and I can answer so, after, yeah. Aggressive uh, has very negative connotations. It usually means about intentionally sort of forcing someone else down. So a lot of the native plants that we call aggressive are ones that if you put them into 
what we have come to see as a conventional garden setting where we have provided a whole bunch of extra nutrients and we've minimized or eliminated or eliminated competition um, where there's regular uh, water resources. Some of these plants will come in and they'll go, oh my goodness, look at all these wasted resources. I'm going to use them all. And to them, any space is a wasted resource, any extra sunlight is a wasted resource, any extra nutrients in the soil, that's all wasted resources, they're going to capture them all. Um, they're, doing their, they're doing their thing, they're doing an amazing job of filling empty spaces in the ecosystem. And if you've ever watched how many species um, thrive on a goldenrod, you, you'll start to appreciate that what they're actually doing is converting all of this stuff, mm. all of what's wasted resources over to what will feed everybody. And common milkweed does the same thing. A lot of these plants, they are big and abundant and generous. Is that a good fit for every garden? Probably not, but there is also swamp milkweed and there's gray goldenrod and zigzag. <laughs> there are species for every site. Uh -huh. um, when it comes to aggressive, their nature is to spread and make use of resources that are going to waste um, and if that's not going to fit your garden that's not the right plant for it mm. um, so I, I tend to call them abundant and, and enthusiastic rather than aggressive <laughs> and uh, can i add to that too Absolutely. This yeah and so like uh, i think also like uh, i like to challenge us um to leverage the characteristics of every plant. And so a plant that is, you know, called aggressive, you know, how can we leverage those characteristics in our garden? Like, you know, some species that are, we, like some people call aggressive, they're actually really useful in combating invasive species. And so, um, and so I challenge people also to say, well, we know that they're generous, like is there a way we can use them? that can also work for us, you know? And also like, uh, I have a Mitzi friend that uh, mentioned to me that, you know, plants uh, make treaties together. So that means that they kind of decide to live together like the goldenrod and the aster. And these two together, they don't, you know, maybe goldenrod would be aggressive, but when it's growing with aster, they kind of have learned to live together and cohabitate. And I think it's also up to us, you know, when we decide to uh, put stuff in our garden to look into nature and try to mimic what we see. So then we find plants that have those 3D relations together and that are used to growing together. And so if you grow asters and golden rocks together, they're gonna balance each other out. But if you decide to plant, you know, golden rod with like something it doesn't have a relationship with or it doesn't grow naturally with and they don't balance each other out in nature but well, that's also where the imbalance comes from you know and so i think you like i'd like to put the onus on us also to learn about those relationships and try to select plants that are friends <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Who do they have a relationship with the uh, when when we're not uh, dictating where they where they must? Yeah, must exactly, grow. exactly. Like sumac grows with like goldenrod. You know, sumac. You know, people find it aggressive. Goldenrod find it aggressive, but together they're in harmony. And so it's yep. up to us to observe what nature is and try to mimic that so that we respect those relationships also, and not just plant plants because we like them. Yep, and actually, I'll I'll add another partner to there who's often missed is um, the native strawberries. They will actually grow under dense goldenrod patches because they come up and they bloom and they set their berries while the goldenrod's just getting started mm. in the season. Mm. But if you open a big patch of uh, Canada goldenrod, it's really common to see a whole ground cover of mm. of the native strawberries underneath. So they've even got a time partnership where the strawberries get the first uh, the start of the season and the goldenrod has the end. So you can start to see more and more layers of relationship yeah. ones that don't just are they're not just paired they're over time mm -hmm. um and the other part of the mix that we often don't notice um when we're looking out at those fields that have that are being overrun with canada goldenrod is um 
the grasses that are filling those fields are European grasses. Uh -huh. And so goldenrod and asters and a handful of other um, native species are actually the only ones that are succeeding in pushing back against an invasion of non-native grasses. Yeah. So we don't see the grasses most of the time, but they actually are having a huge influence on the ecosystem. Um, and sometimes you need those strong abundant species exactly, to yeah. be able to hold that space because they're feeding everybody. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Um, we have another question from Nick. Uh, why not hold an inventory all year? Seems like a good idea. When do you start building your inventory? Oh yeah, so the, okay, so the inventory, like it's a bit challenging to have an inventory, okay? Because like what we're dealing with is a bunch of beginners starting to do seed saving. And because we don't use machines and there's various levels of like dryness and chaff in the envelopes and so forth. And we don't control how you know, people store their seeds and so forth. Like it's, it's challenging to keep an inventory of seeds because you know, there could be mold starting. Like we can't control, like it's not like a company where we can control you know, the product that we receive. And so by just reusing and making sure that everything is fresh, we kind of reduce, you know, the likelihood of disease spreading, making sure that the, we have the highest germination possible. And so, um, so there are like those kinds of, because uh, as soon as you start keeping things for a long time, then you have to put them in like temperature controlled environments and, you know, make sure that it's dark. And, and so it's a lot easier if we just don't keep an inventory. And also like we don't have a physical space for the library yet so it's also like from that perspective too so um and you know success is that they all find a home and you know like they're all sown and so you know like native plant gardening is about being patient and learning patience and you know like adjusting our expectations to appreciate the waiting and the journey and so you start small and then you add a little bit every year and I know at first when I started planting native plants, like it was killing me having to wait, you know, and being told it's going to take three years before you have a full mature native plant garden. And you know what, like that 30 years is going to be next year for me. And I'm like, already? And I was so impatient before, and it really changed me as a person. Like I've learned to appreciate the beauty of the journey. And I encourage you to start doing it. And you'll see like, as you go along, you will develop that too. Yes, uh, that's that's something I completely agree with. It's, uh, and, and especially when you're starting from seeds, there's something about raising a whole bunch of babies and yes. then watching them grow up. It really changes that feeling of impatience from, yeah. well, I bought a plant, why isn't it? doing yeah. what it's said on the label yet versus the yeah. oh, these and they got bigger oh, they've got their first flower it's it's just a different relationship exactly yeah especially if you receive them for free for people like you feel like the kindness of strangers the generosity of your community and then you see like the generousness like of nature coming right away you know the birds are going to come right away the butterfly is going to come right away you know so it's like it's 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 the joy is is in the process. Yes, and actually there was one thing uh, Nate said to say thanks for that in depth answer about the whole aggressive thing. And and poor Nate, <laughs> we didn't want to beat up on you. It's just a question we get a lot about, especially you know people like oh goldenrod. Why would you grow goldenrod? Yes, yes. Um, and I was sitting in front of a goldenrod patch the other day and it had at least seven bumblebees on the one oh, yeah. patch that was yeah, like yeah. I could have wrapped my arms around. But I will also, I should also mention because I did sort of run off on the whole wonders of the really abundant plants. Is there are actually also lots of native species which are much more inclined to sort of just stay in place. Yes. Um, they don't overwhelm the conventional garden. So there are actually lots of native species that you can introduce to conventional garden setting that won't overwhelm it so absolutely yes. there there's a whole range um so um yes and can i add also oh yeah sorry yeah go ahead yeah and i want to say also like yes we probably are wildflower seed library but we also have we also contribute a lot of seeds to people that have big um pieces of land and so what might be aggressive also for a small urban garden like will be perfect for somebody who's trying to naturalize like acres of land. 
And so it's not because it's aggressive also that we shouldn't collect it. It's just we need to make sure it fits with, you know, the intent of the the purpose's effort, you know, the person's efforts. Yeah. Well, and that's and that's back to the getting to know the species. Um, mm. And then there's a there is there's been a lot of years of um, where of building up the expectation that all the plants, as long as you respect their sun shade requirements, have the rest of their soil requirements and most of their moisture mm -hmm. requirements and that are all the same, then they will all sort of co mm -hmm. coexist in the same spaces. Um, but because of that, actually, the ra total range of species we grow in gardens worldwide mm. is much, lots of cultivars, lots of selected traits for this color or that color or this height or that type, but the actual species range mm. is, is compared to what you would find in an eco region is actually quite small um, because it's been really narrowly selected just for, for that particular set of expectations around rich soil, steadily available moisture and that. And there's actually tons of niche, niche adaptations in plant species that rather than changing up your space, um, if you can just find which species want mm -hmm. to be there and bring them, then you just get to stand back and appreciate how glorious they all are once they've established. All right. Well, I'm not seeing more questions in the chat. Are there any last ones before we wrap up? We are going to wrap up in just a couple of minutes. Um, but if you do scroll back, I did share a few links in there. Um, the the Ottawa Wildflower Seed Library one, of course, um, and that's wildflowerseedlibrary.ca. Um, and then that VASCAN site, Vascular Plants of Canada database, is a very, very useful resource, um, both as if you're just kind of going, is this heat from here or not? Um, mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of a lot of plants growing in the wild that you might assume are native, which are not. There's a lot of plants that come up in my garden that I assumed were weedy introductions, which I found subsequently found out were native species. So uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting learning curve. And I shared one other, which is prairiemoon.com, which is um, a native plant and seed nursery. But their website is excellent because um, they provide germination information for the various seeds. So you can find out if a species needs cold treatment or uh, if it's just warm germination or if they need to be refrigerated as soon as they're gathered, things like that. Their website is an absolute treasure trove of information. Also on things like how does this species behave? They can tell you about the species so you can get a sense of is this one for the space I have available or not? Um, and they've got just a huge listing. Not everything on that species or on that site is native to any particular region. They're, they're North American species, but they, so do double check against the VASCAN list um, whether or not they are native. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. So thank you very much for your presentation today. And uh, um, I do want to remind everybody this was recorded and so we are going to um, post this onto the Seoul website and uh, we will be emailing that link out to everybody who participated today but also feel free to share that out to anyone within your network and also to share about this whole series. Uh, we are going to continue next week on our theme of uh, biodiversity with a presentation from Sarah Valentine um, titled Just Add Water, Creating a Pollinator oasis so building off of this supporting your local ecosystem through your gardening activities all right thank you very much everybody thank you thank you melanie bye